35 and 3.1. That's good enough. So let's take a look. 35 and 3.1. Oh, sorry, that's on 3.3. No, that's okay, no problem. I can turn pages. So in 3.3, and we look at 35. Okay, so the mass on the spring vibrates horizontally on a smooth level. Okay, its equation of motion is x of t is 8 sine t, where t is in seconds and x in centimeters. Find the velocity, and it's excellent. So this is the distance formula. Oh, did I start? Yes, I did. Okay, so in order to find the velocity, I have, so the velocity, let me write that first. V of t is the derivative of the distance, right? So why? Because the velocity is the rate of change of x with respect to time. For any t where the function is Thank you. Where the function is differentiable. Well, it turns out that this is 8 sine t. It's differentiable everywhere. It's a smooth, continuous function. It doesn't have corners, vertical tangent, and uh, cusps or corners, as I said. So this is differentiable everywhere. And all I have to do is 8 cosine t. So this is the velocity. Now the acceleration. How do I determine the acceleration? The acceleration is the rate of change of velocity with respect to time. So I will write a of t equals v prime of t or x double prime of t. So the acceleration is the first derivative of velocity or the second derivative of the distance. So I know that cosine t prime is negative sine t, so negative 8 sine t will be the acceleration. Is this OK? Yes. Um, find the position, velo velo position, velocity, and acceleration of the mass at time t equals 2 pi over 3. So what do we have to do? Plug it in. Plug it in. <clears throat> so that's part b. So part b, or the second part is, so I have x of 2 pi over 3, 8 sine 2 pi over 3. Then I have v of 2 pi over 3, which is 8 cosine 2 pi over 3, and a of 2 pi over 3, which is negative 8 sine 2 pi over 3. OK, very good. So let me refresh your memory how to determine this, because I'm pretty sure, I don't know, I haven't looked, but I'm pretty sure that they want an exact answer, not an approximation, most probably. OK, so we want to identify 2 pi over 3 first. OK, here's the unit circle. How much is pi over 3 in degrees? 60, very good. 60 times 2 is? 120. So if this is 180 or pi, then I know that I will be short 60 degrees. So if I div divvy up this quadrant in three equal pieces, 30, 30, 30, then I know that uh, 120 will be this. This angle is 2 pi over 3 or 120 degrees. 60 degrees shy of 180. The next step I have to determine the... Thank you very much. See, I tortured them enough. So they do remember the reference angle, which is pi minus 2 pi over 3, which is, it has to be 60 or pi over 3. So then, when I determine, so sine is positive in these two quadrants, and cosine is positive in these two quadrants, because cosine is measured on the x-axis, and sine is measured on the y-axis. Are you with me? Yes? OK, so then all I have to remember is that sine 2 pi over 3 will be identical with sine pi over 3. Now the question is, what is sine pi over 3? And let me give you that little. So 
This is uh, pi over 6, which is the first angle, pi over 4, which is the next angle, and then pi over 3. Sine of the small angle is 1 half, as, as well as cosine of the large angle. Then cosine of the small angle is the square root of 3 over 2, as well as, co uh, as, well as sine of the big angle. These two are equal, and this is the only angle for which they are equal, square root of 2 over 2. So then I know that sine pi over 3, so this is pi over 3, and this is sine, is, that's it. So then I can come back here and write 8 times the square root of 3 over 2, which be, will be 4 the square root of 3. And I so also can come back here, negative 8 times the square root of 3 over 2, which is negative 4 the square root of 3. Now, careful with cosine, because cosine 2 pi over 3 will not equal cosine pi over 3. Why? because it's negative. So cosine 2 pi over 3 is the opposite of cosine pi over 3, which happens to be 1 half. With minus in front, this is negative 1 half. So I have to come back here, replace this by negative 1 half. 8 times negative 1 half is negative 4. Now, It is wise to remember this little chart. You really don't need anything else but this. So for the smallest angle, 1 half the square root of 3. For the largest angle, the square root of 3 over 2, I meant to write. Let's so just say 1 half and the square root of 3 over 2. For the largest angle, the square root of 3 over 2, 1 half. And for the middle angle, both are the same, the square root of 2 over 2. Very good question. Thank you very much. Anything here? Does it make sense? Okay, no one agrees. Well, does does it? Any questions? Stephen? Yes? So is that the direction? Like in what direction is it moving at that time? Um, in what direction is it moving at that time? Okay, so, very good question. So, if the velocity is positive, Horizontally? Right. So it doesn't matter, but it's it's in the opposite direction. That's all it says. So one thing I forgot, and that's awful, I have to write the measurement unit. So what was the measurement unit? Or oh, they don't give anything. Oh, okay, they do. X in centimeters. And okay. So that is that is a um, huge mistake on my part. Obviously, this is in centimeters. The measurement unit for velocity is per second, and the acceleration is very good. So we can never, ever um, forget about the measurement unit. So the velocity, when it's positive, the particle is moving in the, in the positive direction. When it's negative, the particle is moving in the negative direction. The velocity tells us that. Oh, negative acceleration, yes. Yes. The acceleration is negative and the uh, velocity is negative. It's increasing. Because they work in the same direction. Very good point. So, if if um, the two forces, acceleration and velocity, are opposite, positive, negative, or negative, positive, then uh, the particle is slowing down. If both work in the same direction, either both positive, velocity and acceleration positive, then um, the uh, particle is speeding up. 
in that direction. If they are both negative, the particle is speeding up this direction because they are helping one another. It's not like, for example, I ride my bike and I have a headwind. That's the idea. Of course, it's slowing me down. But if I have a backwind, it will, it, it will speed up. It will help me speed up. That's the same idea. The acceleration is helping as long as they have the same sign. Thank you. OK, next question. Number 13 on 180. So say, say it again, number? 13, 181. 181? Very good. So let's take a look. 13 on 181. Once again, thank you for working on these problems. Thank you. 13. Yes. I have a question about a threshold. Yes. Are we going to get a unit circle? I'm sorry? Are we going to get a unit circle? The unit circle is a reference to any trig function. Yeah, are we going to get it on the test? The unit circle is part of trig, and this is transcendental calculus. All, right. All functions will be there, including hyperbolic, which you will see later, including trig, including inverse trig. Yes. Please, if you need more practice, if you need more practice, please come early on uh, Wednesday or moving forward, and we will work on the unit circle. That's okay. Is that okay? Yeah. I was just wondering if, John? if we got it on the test for now. Oh, if it will be given to you. Yeah. The answer is no. You okay. will have to remember this. All right. That's all. Forgive me. I misunderstood. <laughs> My apologies. Okay. 13 on page 181, and that is... A function a of the variable s equals negative 12 divided by x s to the fifth. I have no idea how the answer is presented. I don't really care. I'm not going to do anything else but this at this point. The denominator is, so remember, please redo the, per, the problems we do in class first. That's very important. So then when I differentiate a prime of s, I bring down the power, I get positive 60 times x to negative, s, not x, s to negative 6, and I get 60 divided by s to the 6th. Does it make sense? Yes. Good. Perfect question. Anything else that you would like me to go back to? Anything else you tried? Anything? Uh, same page? Okay, so we are looking at 23. In 23, we have y equals x squared plus 4x plus 3 divided by the square root of x. The square root of x is the same with x to which power? Uh, x to negative 1. Yes, you're right. 1 half or negative 1 half if I bring it back. Okay, so this is x cubed over the squared. Over the square root of x plus 4x over the square root of x plus 3 over the square root of x as the intermediate step. And x to 2 minus 1 half plus 4x to 1 minus 1 half plus 3x to negative 1 half. And this is what I want to differentiate. Is the prep clear? Okay, so now in order to finish it up, 2 minus 1 half is 4 minus 1, so this is x to 3 halves. This is 1 minus 1 half, which is 1 half, and this cannot be changed. So now I'm ready to find dy prime or dy over dx. Please get used to both notations. So this is going to be, should that 4x be negative 1 minus 1 half is 1 half. That's okay. That's okay. I'd rather go back. <laughs> I'd rather go back. 2 minus 1 half, it's 3 halves. Uh, 1 minus 1 half and negative 1. Is it okay? Everything else? Very good. So this prime is 3 half times x to 3 halves minus 1, which is 1. 3 over 2 minus 3 over 2 minus 2 over 2, right? It's 1 half, right? Correct? Good. And then I bring down, and I have 2, and x to negative 1 half. I bring down negative 2, negative 3 halves, x to negative 1 half minus 1, which is negative 3 halves. 
Now you can say, mm, how would you simplify this? This is important for chapter four. So I will factor out the greatest common factor at the lowest possible exponent. So obviously x is the common factor. And I compare 1 half to negative 1 half to negative 3 halves. And I know that the smallest is so 1 half minus negative 3 halves. OK, 1 half minus, very good. I'm, I'm, oh, it's two. It is 2 with 3 halves. So 3x squared over 2. Right. Then negative 1 half minus negative 3 halves will be oh, 1. So this is plus 2 times x. And the last one is done as negative 3 halves. Now I will find the least common denominator. Very good. So y prime is 1 over 2, the square root of x cubed. And in parentheses, and I can put it at the top, 3x squared plus 4x minus 3. This should be the final answer. And you will see in chapter 4 why. I don't know how they presented it. Any questions on this? Yes, please, Paul. Sure. Oops. Any questions? Is there anything else? Is there anything else we worked on? Any other questions? Yes, please. Caesar, I'm sorry. I have to change this into 4 over 2. If the least common denominator is 2, I have to multiply the top by 2. I cannot simply copy 3x squared plus 2x minus 3 because 2x is over 1. Other questions? Yes, please. I have a question. Um, it's a problem from the checklist, and I don't see one that's like it. Yes. Um, Which section? Uh, section 3 3. 3 3. Problem 54. Problem 54. Or sorry, uh, 3 2. Sorry. Uh, 3 3. 3 dot 1. 3 dot 1. 3 dot 2. And that is 54. Yes. Find equations of the tangent lines to the curve that are parallel to the line. So. Which I know there's, I know there's 2. It doesn't matter how many write down. So how will I determine? Wait, it doesn't matter how many write down? Not this, this form, point in time. Oh, OK. I don't even think of how many. Maybe oh. 1,500, or maybe one, or maybe none. I don't care at this point. Okay. So um, find equations of the tangents line to the curve. What do I have to find? The derivative. The derivative of y. OK. And they have to, the derivative must equal? The slope of the line. You're done. That's it. Well, when I was doing it, um, I don't, I didn't really come up with one of the lines. Usually the Very possible. It may be just one. I don't know. Yes. Joey? Actually, it doesn't matter. Is that two times the Here? square root of? Like two, two, because I factored out this one over two. Wouldn't it be? Oh, never mind. Okay, the two is. You can rewrite it if you want. Yeah. Yes, you can rewrite it as x the square root of x. You can. Sorry, I'll just. Yes, let's come back to your question. Oh, so I was looking at the at the graph of y equals x minus one over x plus one, mm -hmm. um, and I can see that there should be two. Did you graph the, the equation? Yes. Of the uh, of the uh, line yes. as well. Okay. Then you will be able to find two. No, I couldn't find. So I was wondering if we do a problem that's similar to this. Uh, if I find one, uh, I'll be more than happy. Let's look at the uh, end of the chapter. I was thinking the issue was that there is a vertical asymptote. I don't know. I haven't looked at it. 
So let's look. Which one? So let's take a look on page 265 and see if there is anything like that. 265? Yes, 265, 266. Uh, what about problem 66? Let's look at 66 on page 266 and let me know if that's close enough. Let's read 66 on page 266. Here it is. Find the points on the ellipse where the tangent line has slope 1. Is that close enough? Because you have the slope of the line that is parallel to. Uh, sure. It's exactly the same. It's just that it doesn't give a line that has the slope negative one, uh, positive 1. It just says, find the points where the tangent line has slope 1. Okay. Is that good enough? Very good. So we have um, x squared plus 2y squared equals 1. Uh, my apologies. After section 3.5. We don't have enough information right now. So we're going to finish 3.4 and 3.5 today, and I'm going to come back to this. Yes. I'm sorry? 55. Let's take a look. 182. But we'll come back to this. Anyway, today. 182. 55. 55. Uh, find equations of both lines that are tangent to the curve. And parallel to this. Awesome. Very good. But we can also do that, but not before we look at 3.5. So this is 55, and it's 182. Very good. Um, so y equals 1 plus x squared. Uh, no, it's x cubed, sorry. And um, parallel to the line 12x minus y equals 1. So then y equals 12x minus 1, the slope is 12. So far, so good? But so, so I guess my, my issue with this one is that there is a vertical axis. What are we talking not, about? Not on that one. I'm talking about on the, the, the It doesn't one. matter. Okay. It doesn't matter. Is, is the line parallel to the vertical tangent? I don't care. But if it is, it's a big, big problem. But is it? No, because the vertical tangent has, doesn't have slope 12. Right? What do I care about the graph of the function? That's not the right way to address the problem. Grabbing the calculator and graphing it, it's not the right way. Thinking is first. And then you can check. Okay? I don't care how the graph looks like. As long as I can determine, um, the uh, the question was, we want to tend, we want to find the tangent, the equation I forgot. We have to find the equation or just the point. Um, we have to find the it, it's all right. Let's just keep it. So. Okay. So is this okay? Okay, so then I have to find y prime, which is 3x squared. And this is the slope of the tangent line to the graph of the function y at any point. But at some point in time, it has to be 3x squared equals 12. I divide both sides by 3, and I get x squared equals 4, which means x equals plus or minus 2. We are asked again in 55, find equations of both lines. So I find the two points, point P and point Q. You don't have to name them, really. It's not important. 2, comma, uh, 9. And negative 2, it's, uh, what is it? Negative 2, comma, negative 7. I have the slope, 
and I have the point, I'm done. I will find two equations. y minus 9 equals 12 times x minus 2. That's one equation. The other one will be y minus minus negative 7 equals 12 times x minus minus 2. In the same way, I address that problem. I don't care how the function looks like. You probably forgot to take the square root or something. Does it make sense? So let me write for everyone to see what I just said. Yes. I mean, it's the point slope form. It's just algebra. From this point on, there is it's not calculus, right? So y minus y1 equals the slope times x minus x1. First, you plug in 2 and 9 with 12. And then you plug in negative 7, negative 2 with 12. And you will find two equations. So y minus 9 equals 12 x minus 2. You solve for y. And then this is y plus 7 equals 12 x plus 2. And you solve for y. How do you have to get a y prime to the um, 1 prime is 0. I bring down the power. I subtract 1 from the power. And I get 3x squared. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. So maybe that's not clear. It's x cubed. Sorry about that. OK, good. Very good questions. Is this good enough, everyone? Is it a yes or no? Is this good enough? Like yes On this problem. Oh, OK. On this problem. Is that clear? Yes. Yes? Yes, Paul. Go ahead. About how yes. How you found the point, how you determine the point. But can I determine the equation of a line without a point on the slope? No, I don't need the point, but why those? Back to because that's where the slope is 12, okay. right? So when the derivative equals 12, I find two points. One with x equals 2 and the other one with x equals negative 2. I have to plug them back in the function. That's the y value. Right. f of 2 and f of negative 2. Because I not, not x comma f prime of x. Right? X comma f of x. Good. Other questions here? Uh, is yes? 48 on 182 basically the same thing you did? Uh, 48, for 48, 48, 48. Uh, compare the graphs of f and f prime and use them to explain why your answer is reasonable. But that's basically for the first problem we did, isn't it? So it says find f prime of x and then compare and use them to explain why your answer is reasonable. Um, oh, 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 I'm sorry, 47, not 48. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. 48 is the problem. That's okay. Oh, yes. The equation of motion, yes, where S is in BS, absolutely the same. So that's, okay. Yes. Then I'm um, that. Yes, I don't remember which number that was, but the one of the, the ones that yeah, we started with. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Very good questions. I really thank you for that. Anything else? I do have one. Yes. Um, so this is just if we can find something similar because it was off of the checklist. Yes. Um, which problem one? 44 yes. on 198. Very good. I think it was using properties that you said we weren't learning yet. Oh, yeah. We had an example last time. Of a, using like... Okay, let me give you a hint. I solved this problem last time. So now I know that not everyone goes back to the notes first. Oh, no. I wrote, I wrote down all the notes. Okay. Because we did, we did 48. Yeah, we did 42, then we went to 48. <laughs> okay. Clear? A good enough example for what you need. Oh, so Unless uh, John wants to put his cell phone away, he may be able to follow. Yes. Is this good enough, Steve? Steven? Uh, yeah, I mean, if it's the same process. It's identical process. I only have 4 and 6 instead of uh, 3 and 5. Okay. Good enough? Yeah, how I saw the answer was significantly different. Okay. <coughs> but Just remember, all we have to do is use the limit 
as the box approaches zero from sign of the box over the box, and that will be one. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all we need. As long as all these are the same. And algebraically, you can always multiply and divide by the same quantity. Okay. If you need 100 here, a, and you have 100 here, it's, you still haven't changed anything. Got it. Multiplying top and bottom by the same number would not change anything. Just make sure you do to the top and the bottom, because yep. otherwise you do change. Good enough? Excellent. Uh, anything else? OK, so finally we got to the chain rule. So this is section 3.4. So, the chain rule refers to function composition. What is function composition? F comp G of X, which means, which is the inner function? Yes, the closest to x is the inner, and the one that is applied to f is the perfect. That's why we emphasize this uh, in pre-calculus, and in which I ask my students to say, okay, decompose this function. So I gave them a function like, uh, let's say, f of x equals 1 over x squared plus 1, and I said, Find an inner function. There is more than one correct answer. Find an inner function and find the outer function. And my students at that time said the inner function is the first one you apply to x. So then the inner is 1 over, I'm sorry, it's x squared plus 1. And then they said, OK, what? Well, now give me the outer. And they said 1 over x. So the inner is x squared plus 1, and the outer is 1 over x. So that's why we studied this in pre-calculus. We decompose a function into the inner and then the outer. Can I come up with three functions? Of course. But there is no need. So this is what we're trying to differentiate, which is a totally different formula, a different step, everything different than the quotient rule, the product rule, or anything else we've seen so far. So when we want to different, so by the way, this is f of g of x. Inner, outer. First we apply the inner, which in this case is x squared plus 1. Once I get a number, I apply 1 over x to it. So the question is, how do we differentiate this? The function composition. We start, so let me just draw your attention to something very important. If I ask you to evaluate this function, you will start with the inner, right? You get, let's say, 15, whatever, and then you say 1 over 15, correct? But when we differentiate, we do not start with the inner function. First, we differentiate the outer, and then we multiply by the inner function prime. So what we differentiate is f prime of g of x times the inner function prime. This is what we call the chain rule. Now, we did apply it several times, but I did not tell you that. But now I will. So when we differentiated x to the nth, what did we do? We bring the power. So what is the inner and what is the outer? The power is the outer, right? Because how do I evaluate this? First, I plug in x. And then I raise it to the nth power. I don't raise it to the nth power, and then I apply, I replace x by, right? So we said n times x to negative 1 times the inner function prime. 
I didn't say that. Why? Because x prime is exactly. So there was no need to write this. But this is the exact same situation. We differentiate the outer, which is n times x to n minus 1. The inner function is x, so g prime, which is x prime, is 1. So here's an example. Let's say I have sine of 4x. These are two functions. And you can say I can even consider two more. Fine. But let's say, what is the inner function? What is the outer function? So can anyone dictate the derivative of this? If you dictate sine x prime, you would say sine prime multiplied by the inner function prime. But there is no need because this is 1. And you will automatically say cosine x. So then sine of a function prime is yes, cosine of 4x multiplied by no because the derivative of 4x is 4 times the inner function prime so of course I will rearrange it at 4 cosine 4x and that's the end of it okay now yes please so the On, in this one, in the pure sine function. But this is not pure sine function. This is sine applied to a new function, which is 4x. If sine is applied to plain x, yes. But if I have, here's another example. Let's say now I want to apply cosine to 4x squared minus 3x plus 1. And I want to differentiate this. Can anyone identify the inner function? And then we'll look in the book and I'll let you choose whatever you want. So what is the inner function? Right. What is the outer function? Good. So I need to, I'm not decomposing the function. I'm differentiating. So I have to differentiate the outer and then eventually get to the inner to differentiate that as well. Now, it's clear that if this, this is x, the answer is negative sine x and I'm done times x prime. But this is, the derivative of this is not 1. Good. So then cosine prime is negative sine of the same argument. Don't forget. So f of g prime is f prime of g of x. Have to copy the function, which is the inner, which is 4x squared minus 3x plus 1. Now I have to multiply by the inner function prime, which is awesome. Excellent. Yes, like with the square root, we don't like to put anything behind it. The same with sine, because I may be tempted to say that I have to multiply these two and then apply sine. It could be rare. It's unlikely, but I recommend negative 8x minus 3 in front and then sine 4x squared minus 3x plus 1, and this is final. Any questions on this? Um, yes, Paul, go ahead. Would it make sense to distribute that? Uh, no, because we really want uh, everything in descending order with the positive leading coefficient. Because of chapter 4. And because of what we agreed on in uh, algebra. Okay. I'm sorry? Okay. Now, since you meant, no, 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 I'm sorry. I, I, was, uh, I was just saying that, uh, like with the square root, we don't like to put anything behind it. I'm not going to write the square root of x, x minus 1. Because I may be tempted to make the error. So that's the reason why we like not to write anything. So the same thing with sine and cosine and tangent. So 
I'm not confused and say, oh, I have to multiply these two and then apply sign to it. Let me just see if I, no, I'm not there yet. Okay, very good. So now, when we combine, combine the chain rule with the power rule. This is extremely important. We have not combined it yet. Let's take a look. I had a function of another function. I had a function of another function, right? But this time, we want to look at the combination of the chain rule with the power rule. I have to be very careful. So here it is. One more time. If I differentiate x to the nth power, which is a plain x raised to the nth power, I know the answer is n times x to n minus 1 times x prime. Leave it alone. I know it's 1. But now I have a function raised to the nth power. Please follow the pattern and tell me what to write. Oops, you did say you are very powerful tonight. Don't tell me something. Don't tell me to jump from the Empire State Building. I may. So n multiplied by? F. Raised? F. It raised to n minus 1. Times? Minus F. To 1. F prime. That's it. Sorry. That's it. So it's the same thing. Here I did not need to talk about it because this happened to be 1. But here I have to talk about it because it's not going to be x. It's going to be any function. Now, do we remember this prime? We had to commit this to memory. Please, this is very important. Please, John, you want to say something? No. Anyone? I think I don't. Say it again, Betty. Yes? Very good. But now I would like you to tell me, this is, that's why this is so important to remember. Now I would like you to, I meant to write the prime outside. Now I would like you to give me this. So this time, yes, go ahead, please. Very good. So careful, careful, careful. You only gave me this. It's not done. Oh, it's not, uh, uh, That's it. So be very careful. This is another example in which the chain rule is combined with the power rule. What is the power on this function? Exactly. So this is, again, a combo with, with um, the chain rule with the power rule. Now here's another example for you, and then I'll let you choose e raised to a function prime. No. No, wait. wait. So e to the f times f prime. Exactly. e to the f multiplied by f prime. Why? Because e to the whatever is the only function. E to whatever. Exactly. Exactly. Any questions on this? Okay, a combo, and then I let you choose. Here, so here, this is more sophisticated now. So let's say I want sine cubed of 2x squared minus 3. Let's identify how many functions we see here. What is the outermost function? Power 3. What is the next? What is the last function? So they have to be in the exact this order. The outer, the inner, and then the innermost. The outer prime, the inner prime, and the innermost prime. I'm ready when you're ready. Three. Yes. Times four x. Co no no, hold on, hold okay, on, hold three. on. Three sine. Yes. Where? Very good. Of very good. 
we only for now we only differentiated the power that was the first derivative now I'm moving on to the second derivative which is very good of so I'm done with the first function which is the outer I continue with the inner prime and now I have to finish with the innermost prime Yeah. Very good. I will have to rearrange by only putting 4x in front and multiplying by 3. There is nothing else required here. No one can simply. So the simple. So 12x. So don't forget to. Uh, let me just copy this and uh, I'll ask, answer your question. Yes, please. Joey? I have to differentiate. I have to differentiate the next inner. Right, but you don't use the, the outer function to differentiate in the first. I'm done. Once I differentiated the power is three times whatever to n minus one, and now I did, did differentiate the whatever, and then the inside of whatever, because there are three functions. Okay, we're ready to choose anything you want. Please, on page 205, anything you want, one, uh, 7 through 46. Thirty-nine. Thirty-nine it is. Thirty-nine. So, very good pick. 39 uh, is f of t equals tangent e to t plus e to tangent t. Awesome. First of all, how do I differentiate the sum? That is not a function composition. The sum of functions, the difference of functions, the product of functions, and the quotient of functions is not function composition. It's algebra of functions. So where is the function composition? Right here, the inner and the outer. Where is the function composition? Here, the inner and the outer. So when I differentiate a sum, I differentiate each function by itself. Where does this come from, by the way? It comes from here. Limit of f plus g when x approaches a. If both exist, if both functions are differentiable, what will be the answer? Right. So that's what it is. I differentiate this, and I differentiate this as long as they are differentiable. That's where it's coming from as a, com as a comparison. So this is, these are the limit laws plus limit of g as s approaches a. Right? If both exist and they're numbers and so on and so forth, the same idea. Because the derivative is a limit. Very good. So, outer inner. So please tell me what to write. First, I have to differentiate the outer. So one more time, when I decompose a function, first I look at the inner and then the outer. But when I differentiate, I differentiate the outer first and then the inner. Very good. Secant squared of? Very good. Times the inner function prime, which is? Awesome. Plus? Yes. Times? Secant squared of? Exactly. No one can simplify this. Don't even try. Very good pick. Anything else? 26 or something similar to 26 because I think I chose it. It's extremely important. So we can make one up uh, similar to 26. Uh, say it again. 28 is good too. Okay, let's look at 28 and then we have to um, look at a function. We can choose a function from the end of the chapter. I'm sure there must be one in there. Uh, let's see. 
Yes, uh, like 42. If you'd like to look at 42 on page 265. So that will be the next one. Okay, so let's look at 28. In 28 we have y equals e to u minus e to negative u divided by e to u plus e to negative u. Do you need to reset the camera? I mean, yes, thank you, thank you.